happening in, in the industry. Now today that talk will be a, the basis, the working basis for all 3GBP based talks uh, throughout the week. So I know it's late in the afternoon, I know some of you are jet lagged, but I think it's worth paying attention because a lot of things which will come up here will be very useful uh, later on during that week. Thank you very much. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Misha, and um, again, thanks for the invitation, and I really appreciate to be here. First time in Barcelona, actually, so unfortunately I have to leave tomorrow, but nevertheless, um, I will try to enjoy as, mu as much as possible. I think it's already... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, basically, I got the um, task to talk about CGP LT Evolve Packet System and what it is in general. So uh, the Evolve Packet System is a very huge and large, let's say, thing if you want so. And um, I try to cover the most important aspects of of the EPS, which is basically the core network the quality of service architecture, and also, of course, um, a little bit on the radio access uh, side. Also, I will not go into too much detail here because I saw that tomorrow uh, there is Willem Mulder from MIMO ON, who's really an expert on this topic, so I think he will also give a nice overview about this topic there. So, and again, um, also because we are talking about femtosas, I had to uh, insert this small substance here GP evolved packet system, and what has it to do with femtosas? So it will also, um, uh, let's say, one of the topics I will address here. Let's go on. So, that's the outline of my talk. So, first, I would like to talk a little bit about um, where does CGP EPS come from, where does LTE come from. So, I will give a short overview about the, if you want, so history of cellular mobile networks starting from UMTS. So not so far away if we want so. And also about the motivation of why is this happening, why did this, um, is this development started. Then we'll give an overview about the Evolve Packet System architecture, including the um, QS architecture, the different, different functional entities which are defined by uh, 3GPP, and also about the, uh, let's say, a little bit about other access systems or other radio access technologies than 3GP, which are also um, possible to be integrated into EPS. Then I give an overview of, about evolved UTRAN, so e UTRAN, you see it here. Um, well, that, that's basically the uh, radio access side, and uh, UTRAN means E is always evolved in this context. UTRAN means UMTS, Terrestrial Radio Access Network. So that's basically everything which has to do with base stations and in the old UMTS times also with the RNC. And um, then I will talk a little bit about femtocells and what's the specific CGPP approach to femtocells. Because that's a little bit different to the, let's say, uh, often commonly perceived idea of femtocells just as small cells. That's a little bit more here. And if I have time, I will give a very brief outlook on LT Advance and, and currently hot topics, which are um, expected to become, become important over the next yeah, few years. So first of all, I would like to give an overview of what the progression of cellular peak data rates looks like. And if you see here, we start with a good old GSM system, which all of you use most probably. We have data rates about 9.8 9 kilobit per second. And over the year, we have a nearly tenfold increase every five years towards very high data rates which are currently the peak data rates <coughs> which are currently envisioned are in the range of one gigabit per second. So this is basically a uh, requirement which came from the ITUR, which defined an IMT advanced program. And in this program they said, we want to have the next generation mobile network, basically uh, 4G if you want so, or beyond 4G. And this mobile network should support peak data rates of up to one gigabit per second. You can also see that um, there was quite a large time 
between GSM and GPRS. GPRS was basically the, the first really um, packet-based radio system. So it's a, a time of approximately up to yeah, close to 10 years. And after the success of GPRS, the development really started to take off. So first we had Edge, which is basically an enhancement of GPRS. Then we had UMTS with promised peak data rate up to two megabit per seconds. We all know that that didn't happen so much. It was more around, let's say, 384 kilobit per second. Then we went to HSDPA in 2005. So this was the first time we really had an, um, let's say, a transition from the circuit switch approach, which was basically the, the principal foundation of GSM and also from UMTS, to a packet switch approach. So circuit switch basically means that you reserve, an, uh, let's say, an end-to-end -end circuit between users or between yeah, participant in a communication. And it's also where the term operator comes from, yes? So an operator was somebody who actually plugged, plugged uh, let's say, different lines to different end-to-end -end connections. And it took a long time for the operators to come away from this paradigm and to reach the packet-switched paradigm, which means you are transporting packets, like in the internet, and are routing them or scheduling them if you need it. Then um, WiMAX came in 2006, I would say, in a uh, first deployment. And uh, this was a little bit shock, shocking for the 3 gp people, because uh, they could see well, we have a new air interface, and WiMAX was a, a system which was, at this time, quite ahead of the capabilities of uh, CGP systems. So this also give, gave CGP kind of an extra kick to develop HSPA plus, and then and finally LTE. And I, I'm saying this because my background is actually from WiMAX, so I'm a, a WiMAX guy. I uh, went there for uh, three years, basically. And, um, yeah, I think it has a lot of positive influence all on, on the CGP side. And finally, we have here Biomix 2.0, so I got to the 16M, and LTE Advanced. And, of course, this, let's say, graph is a little bit misleading because peak data rates, as you may know, they are, first of all, only reach in laboratory um, environments. And second, that's a comparison not very fair because with the um, increasement of the data, it's also the use spectrum increase hugely. And especially for reach, this only a bit per second, ITUR said you can use 100 megahertz of bandwidth, so of spectrum bandwidth, basically. Yes? Theoretical uh, analysis or just a demonstration, actual demonstration in laboratory? No, this is a, a peak data rates. If you, if you take a specification and assume all the best, basically, then you uh -huh. get this data. But I'm wondering with 100 megahertz, if it's, uh, LD has to achieve uh, 1 gigahertz, then it means it will rely on six, higher modulation than 64 quam. No. What, what, what uh, will be done is actually... Um, MIMO? Um, yes, a little bit MIMO, of course. But uh, the most important aspect is spectrum. So what they do, they do carrier aggregation. They take different parts of, maybe even scattered across the spectrum, yeah. and all surf it at the same time. And it this, by this means, you can reach 100 megahertz. Yeah, okay, including that uh, um, carrier aggregation, because in LTE we have around 20 megahertz. Yes, LTE maximum. Yeah. maximum. And LTA with carrier aggregation will have 100 megahertz. Yeah, maximum. So if we want to reach 1 gigahertz, it means we need to transmit 10 bits. Yes. So, but 64 quam gives us 6 bits. Yeah, plus, plus. With, uh, with, with no coding. And with coding, yeah. it even less than that. And with signaling, even less than that. Yes, I, I agree. Mm. So, uh, what has been done, uh, the LT Advanced standard, also 16M standard, has been, let's say, designed in a specific way with eight, with, um, um, with spatial multiplexing, with eight antennas and all mm -hmm. that stuff, mm -hmm. that you can, in theory, reach this one gigabit okay. percent. Yeah, <laughs> That's basically. Okay. I, I'm not saying that it will ha ever happen, but <laughs> in theory, it's possible. 
Well, <clears throat> and of course, what you also need are smaller cells, femtocells. You need, you need to um, increase the spatial reuse in, in order to have, um, let's say, the, the number of users which share the same spectrum should be reduced. So what are the main drivers and the main motivations here? This kind of, on, let's say, motivations from user perspective, from business perspective. And maybe this uh, citation is quite interesting. That's basically the start of LTE. That's defined in this uh, technical report you say, see here, 22.987. That was on a report on feasibility of an like, long-term evolution. I don't know the exact name. And there seems to be a common understanding in the mobile communications industry that the technical and commercial evolution of this industry sector points towards an AIPN. So AIPN is an all IP network. So that was basically the main driver behind this. And all IP network implies also that all the internet applications should, yeah, will be transported about, about, above on top of cellular networks. And of course, you have the typical, um, let's say, drivers like you need high-speed mobile access, diverse no mobile network services, seamless services, experience across access technologies, and so on. So if you think, just think of uh, Siri. Who of you has an iPhone 4S? Nobody? So iPhone 4S, actually, the Siri application, every time you use it, it sends a request to the Apple server and processes the data there and sends the request back to your, to your iPhone, which then basically interprets it correctly. This has a huge impact on the, um, let's say, bandwidth requirements of mobile services. This means that every time, uh, or at any time, there can be a new development, a new innovation coming from this a huge internet innovation pool, if you want so, which increases the uh, demand for bandwidth drastically. And um, that can be sometimes also a problem. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there was recently some news about an, an operator, a large operator, which basically had to shoot, shut down or experienced some outages in the network because of um, Android systems, basically, because they are sending permanently some kind of signaling data. <laughs> and, well... <laughs> There is, let's say, put it like this, there's always need for more bandwidth and always need for more optimizations into this area. Well, other drivers from a business per perspective, of course, large volumes of IP traffic in a cost-effective manner, which means um, operators want to charge for these large volumes of IP traffic and kind of new, let's say, services user-to-user, user, user to multicast traffic over IP. Non-CGP access technologies with minimum impact is, refers to uh, basically to Wi-Fi and also to a lesser extent now also to WiMAX, which is uh, perceived as being, uh, let's say, more cost efficient for deployment more often. Interworking with other networks, but considering mobility, security, charging, and QS. Charging is a very important point here. QS, of course, of course too. And a control fixed mobile convergence issues, okay. Then from a technology perspective, well, always good, higher data rates to end users, multiple ready access system. And I also would say that there was also a, let's say, drive coming from competing standards. So this refers to CGPP, this, this slides here. So mobile Vimex challenged market and technology leadership of CGP systems, so they basically had to react and def uh, develop a new system which is, um, let's say, um, competitive mobile WiMAX. So this is a, another overview which shows the, um, the radio technologies which have been in use over the time. Also quite interesting because what you can see is that there is a convergence of different radio technologies towards OFDMA. I think most of you guys are probably uh, coming from the physical layer. Um, perspective, you all know what OFDMA is, I assume strongly. And um, you can see here, it all started either with GSM or with IS95. This was a CDMA system um, in the United States, or is still, it's still active. And um, so GSM, uh, GPRS, Edge used TDMA, FDMA, 
uh, multiple access, um, IS-95 uses CDMA and wideband CDMA, also UMTS uses wideband CDMA. Then the evolution went to HSPA, so HSPA is high speed packet access, which basically um, was an, let's say, a uh, successful attempt to, to packetize the UMTS system, which is, as I said before, um, still in the circuit, switch, circuit switched paradigm. And then uh, OFTM A come into the play, and we started this fixed WIMAX, mobile WIMAX, and then finally LTE release 8, um, which then evolution, uh, yes, will be developed, or is developed already, partially in LTE release 10, which is LTE advanced, by the way, uh, according to 3TP. And I would more say LTE advanced are releases beyond release 10, because there the real new stuff will come. Um, so why, why actually did, is OFDMA the, um, let's say, multiple access or yeah, technology of choice today? There are five reasons. The first is, you know this, ro it's robust in multi-pass environments. Um, what more interesting is that you have a possibility to do a, sp a flexible spectrum allocation simply by adjusting the number of OFDMA carriers. If you think of other technologies, that's not so simple, it cannot be, so, uh, be done so simple. In, for example, a wideband CDMA, they have always um, five megahertz bandwidth, and you cannot adjust it simply by removing a few subcarriers there, and uh, you can then use it in another band. This is a large, uh, let's say, advantage of OFDMA over other um, technologies. Uh, receiver hardware is now, um, there are now efficient implementations of receiver hardware. MIMO can be done nicely in frequency domain. So it's also not so simple. I'm not an expert, but it's also not so simple uh, to be achieved in uh, CDMA systems. And of course, you can uh, nicely utilize the frequency diversity gain. If you, yeah, you all know this, of course, if you have a wideband um, radio channel. Yes. For example, among the key players? Uh, hmm. Let's say there are some companies which are still, <laughs> large companies which are still interested in WiMAX. Too, and they will develop it. As a competition to LT? I would not say it's really a competition. It's more, let's say, so there, there are operators which have deployed uh, WiMAX networks. Okay. Yes. And it's about migrating or evolution of these networks towards higher um, data rates. Okay, okay. And you have two possibilities. Either you can um, yeah, completely build up an, a new LTE system, mm -hmm. which means you do mm -hmm. don't have any <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. um, data service until this time, or you can enhance the current system, but maybe you can also build in parallel up an LTE system. Okay, okay. and uh, where does 802.16J fit? Means, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, J was on an enhancement for um, relay station. For, for relays, yes. Um, and I M, so how does M differentiate from E? So, uh, yeah, so J is basically an enhancement of 16E. Okay, yeah. Also, yes. For relays, yeah. For relays, yes. And this M is for, means how does it differ differentiate from yeah. E? M is, was originally supposed to be just an, 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 as an, an, an let's say, um, enhancement of 16E. Mm -hmm. So by taking certain part of 16E and increasing it, uh, in improving it a little bit. But in, in the end, it was a completely new standard. Mm -hmm. So it was just recently approved to be a completely new standard, which is, has, yeah, stands on its own, basically. And it supports relays? Uh, it supports relays, yes. So there's no need for J, no? No. At least not for, uh, I wouldn't say that, but at least not in 16M systems. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, 16M absorbed J and enhanced it, actually. Oh, so yeah. So you don't need J7. And also supports femtocells, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, now after talking about that, I would like to give an, so maybe an overview of what is 3GBP in the end, because there are so many, so 3GBP is, is often referred to as an, 
a kind of institution which builds or creates all these uh, standards. And um, maybe it's interesting to know what they are actually doing, what they are consisting of. So they were fi founded in 1998 um, by different standardization organi organizations, so um, national standardization organization like ARIBE, uh, that's Japanese, ETSI, was, well, you, knew, uh, you know it, uh, that's um, the European um, Telecommunication Standardization Institute. Then T1, um, work group from, from 80s, this is um, from the US. TTA, that's Korean. And um, TTC, that's again Japanese. Don't ask me what's the difference between both. And now we also have the CCSA, that's from the, um, basically the Chinese standardization organization. So these um, national standardization organizations basically form the, the body um, which uh, forms uh, CGPP. And CGP gives an, if CGP releases a standard, it will be transformed into an, a national standard after this. So if, for example, if you go to the ARRIVE website, you can see the exact same documents which were also provided by CGP on their website, just that it's called ARRIVE now. Yes? And they have market relationships to many other uh, interest organizations, such as Femto Forum, GSMA, UMTS Forum, and so on. And the scope was originally to uh, specify a 3G system, that's therefore the name, Third Generation Partnership Project, which basically in the end resided in UMTS. So UMTS, Universal Mobile Telecommunication System, talked about this before, it's basically based on white and CDMA. But today it's responsible for all, so it basically inherited um, all the uh, communication standards from Etsy. So this includes GSM, GPRS, and Edge. So it's, it's responsible for maintenance of these systems. Uh, also for UMTS uh, and uh, UTRAN, so the radio access network part of it. So there are still some developments going on in HSPA. And um, of course, all the development of the evolved UTRAN, which this is basically LTE. Yes, so LTEs, evolved UTRAN, and CGP core network e evolution, or best, maybe a better term would be um, system architecture evolution. And uh, now it's also written in uh, some of the documents there, CGP considers a long-term evolution. So that's basically the long-term evolution is not only as a certain release, so it's the whole, let's say, process of improving um, the CGVP. Um, technology. Sorry, Andreas. Yeah. Just, uh, one question. Can you go one slide back, please? Yeah. Um, so all these organizational partners um, funded 3GPP, OK? Yes. So they are part of 3GPP, right? Yeah. So in 3GPP, they develop um, technical documentation. Yeah. That, but this documentation is not a standard, right? It's not an official standard, because CGP has not the legal power to to define it as this, as this, if you want so. Okay, so this documentation is used by the organizational partners to yeah. to publish the standards, At right? At least that's my, my understanding, yeah. Okay, and, uh, uh, and related to that, um, besides the 3GPP documentation, these uh, partners, on their own, they also develop technical documentation, uh, right? So, uh, for example, ARRIVE takes the CGPP documentation approves this if you want so and makes their own stamp on it that's okay. now an ARRIVE uh -huh. 3G system but it's basically the same yeah no but uh, my question was more related to the fact that for example Etsy yeah uh, they all the I mean uh, the partners of Etsy also develop technical documentation yes, different yes. to, to uh, yeah, that yeah. of 3GPP of course, but of then they, they publish the 3GPP documentation as a standard yes so uh, they are just creating different standards at the same time Yes, I mean, Etsy, for example, has a much broader, broader scope than CGP. They develop also, let's say, vehicular communication technologies mm -hmm. and probably much more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, so, CGP standard releases, so uh, stable release, so what is a release? A release is something a stable re release across all documents of all specification groups, if you want so. So there's a freezing date, and after this freezing date, there will be no new major features come into this release. For example, if, 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 if um, 
now uh, release 11 hopefully defines carrier aggregation, then this should be finished. There will, yes, there will not be something major new um, features into this release. And we have an overview of some major 3GP releases, so starting from release 99, release 4, release 5, very important one because this is HSDPA, all of you use. Release 6 included, uh, introduced in the enhanced uplink. Now HSTPA become HSPA, which is high speed packet access. So high HSTPA is high speed downlink packet access. Then release 7, improvements for HSPA plus, yes, you get some higher data right there. IMS is the IP multimedia system, which is basically used as a, um, let's say, platform for any kind of um, voice, um, yeah voice call set up in LTE, or not only voice, there are many different kind of multimedia applications there, but this is one of the main applications. Then release eight <coughs> is the evolved packet system, release nine further improvements, and release 10 is basically LTE advanced. Of course, there will be more releases. Release 11 is currently in development. Freezing date, I think, is end of 2012, and release 12 is already let's say, started. There are already some work items which are um, under discussion there. So I had also the idea to, to show you some, let's say, um, idea what's all going on in the, uh, the different um, specification groups, but I think we should maybe speed a little bit up. So. TSG JRAN, so this is technical specification group, it's TSG. JRAN is the GSM Edge radio access network, so the old legacy network, uh, basically, GSM. This is still active here, maintenance and development um, of uh, the, yeah, all aspects regarding radio here. Then we have the RAN uh, specification group, so everything which is going on in the, u in the user equipment and in the base station and also in the RNC for UMTS. Uh, regarding radio transmissions, basically. MACFI is done here. Then we have the system architecture group, which basically defines the um, evolved packet core and also the services, uh, the service architecture, including the quality of service architecture. And then we have the um, core network and terminals group, which is responsible for uh, stuff like IMS and um, SIM card specifications, and um, let's say four network interfaces, protocols, and um, yeah, all these uh, aspects which are quite scary. I don't want to go into detail here. So if you, so I don't know how familiar you are with this website, but if you press on the CGP website on the uh, specification, um, button and then on spef specification numbering button you come to this page basically just looking a little bit nicer and this gives you an overview of all the different uh, let's say um, documents which are grouped into the series starting with different numbers and I try to, to highlight some of the more important one if you if you are looking for something a certain aspect for example like uh, how is how is Evolve Packet Core uh, defined? What's, what's, what are the important um, documents here? You can, for example, go here to this um, techni technical realization um, subject. So that's the 23 series. And here you find some important specifications regarding the EPC, which is 23.401. OK, don't want to go into detail here. But you will find that everything related to service architecture and to the core network you can find in this um, specification group. Then we have radio aspects. So this is only for UMTS. So there's nothing about LTE in, uh, in this uh, series here. And then, of course, we have here LTE and LTE advanced radio technology. That's the 36 series. So there you will find everything related to Mac and Phi of, um, of LTE or Evolve Tron. And especially here is document 36300, the overall description document. I'm sure that most of you have read it completely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And we also have here 37, that's quite new. Here we have some, for example, uh, mobility enhancement 
and for uh, home E node B, that's a technical study um, item there. CPP freezes the release, it becomes a liability on operators to implement those features in the reports no. or no. no? It has to be standardized. Uh, Even after standardization, well, well, oh, there, uh, there are always some core parts which have to be implemented and optional parts which are uh, must proprietary, not be, yeah. uh, not on proprietary, mm. are standardized, mm. but there's not necessarily a need to implement them. And the um, standardization local to each country? Or it means, for example, for LT? Well, okay. <laughs> Maybe I should. So the standard is defined de facto by CGP, but it will become a legal standardization mm -hmm. document in, from the national um, standardization entities. At least that's my understanding. Okay. Okay. But like multinational companies, for example, NEC has launched <laughs> base station, LT base station back yes. in 2010. Um, which contained a load balancing feature. Yeah. But load balancing was not there in release 9, not it, neither it was there in release 8. Yes. It came into being in release 10. Yeah. But by that time, I mean, release 10, 10 came into some after the product was already launched. Yes. So how did it work? Means they launched the product before of course. the release was frozen? Uh, yeah, this can also happen, yeah. So well, they took the risk? Yeah, yes, always the risk that you implement some pre-standard um, mm -hmm. product, which then may lead to some problems later if, <laughs> if mm -hmm. there are significant, let's say, di uh, differences in the standard itself after after the release. Yeah. Or they have some kind of hidden insight into the standard before it's made public, Means because they're members of. Well, of course, you can then try in, in, in during the standardization process to, to mm -hmm. influence the standardization group mm -hmm. to let's say, not implement certain changes. Okay. That's always <laughs> so the goal of <laughs> political. <Yeah. laughs> OK, so now we come to the real thing, um, overview of the Evolve pack Packet System architecture. The first of all, maybe, was, so what's, what's EPS, Evolve Packet System? The Evolve Packet System is both Evolve Packet Core and the Evolved UTRAN, so Evolved um, yeah, radio access network, if, if you want so. So if, if we talk of EPS, we, we mean the whole, let's say, system, which, is, which you can see in, in, in terms of a an, 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 uh, mobile phone or something, and all the network which comes is, is located in the mobile operator and, um, yeah, is also standardized. So EPS designed to be a purely packet switch system. It is quite new in comparison to, to the to the, um, let's say, UMTS core, which was implemented before, which means basically that the IP multimedia subsystem, so IMS, is targeted as a voice service platform. So if you, will, um, if you want to make a voice call, then you will basically send um, session initiation protocol messages towards the mobile network and um, the system processed um, correspondingly. So the EPS is similar to the GPIS core, but it's more flat. So one of the um, nodes in the user plane have been removed, and but the general uh, the GPIS tunneling protocol remains the main protocol for CGP accesses, which basically means that all data I can show it in the next slide maybe all data which is sent between different nodes in the EPS is tunneled with this protocol here. And this protocol, GPS tunneling protocol, is standardized also by CGPP. And also the EPS enables, so this was one of the major design goals originally, <coughs> EPS also enables the interworking with non-CGPP accesses. For example, Wi-Fi, of course, uh, WiMAX, and CMA2000. And um, there is also there are various options for mobility between CG different CGP access and non-CGP access, and one is also based on, on either on proxy mobile IP or on dual stack uh, mobile IP. Oh, what was this? Ah, better. So let's have a look at the, let's say, 
um, basic um, architecture of an EPS system. So on the very left side, you have the user equipment, which is basically the, the mobile phone. Then you have here an, an interface called LTE UU. Then here's EUTRAN. These are basically base stations, e node beats in that case. And then you have various, let's say, functional entities in the core network. I think I also have a nice animation here. So on the other side of the, let's say, of the whole mobile network is the PDN gateway, the packet data network gateway. So that's basically the, po the point where all the data is um, entering, oh, hmm. so all the data is leaving uh, the um, mobile operator network, yes? So this is happening in the PDN data gateway, which also implies if you are downloading, for example, a web page somewhere, uh, maybe here, this here should also be the internet, <laughs> then all the data has to go here through to all these nodes until it uh, arrives at the UE and also the other way around. Also, it's um, uh, responsible for IP address allocation. <coughs> And um, also, it's responsible for charging, basically, at least, yeah. And uh, it enforces all, all the quality of service. Important point, we'll see it later. So the second is a serving gateway. So that's a, the serving gateway is a, a mobility anchor. So if you move from one, um, from one E node B to the another E node B, then um, the GTP tunnels, which are existing here, between the EU tron, between the E node Bs, and the serving gateway, they are switched from one no E node B to the next one. Yes? So therefore, this is a, a mobility anchor. Then we have the MME, the mobility management entity. <coughs> and this is, as the name already says, responsible for everything related to mobility in terms of yeah, management, for example, for um, mobility in, in, in idle mode, so where you are going to one, uh, from one E node B to the next one in the UE, has to send periodically, periodically some location update information so that the MME knows then uh, where the UE currently is, yes, in which coverage area from which E node B the, uh, the UE is located. Paging, paging means that uh, if an incoming call tries to basically connect to your UE, the MME is responsible for finding this user equipment then. Um, authentication, bearer management, etc. And as next one, we have the PCRF. That's the policy control and rules function, which basically is about yeah, providing policies for, Q for quality of service enforcement. So for example, if it finds out that you are using Skype somehow, then the operator could try to give them a better quality of service than comparison to just an example. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we also have roaming between different operators. Therefore, we have here the example with, an visit, uh, with a visiting, uh, visited um, public land mobile network. So this is visited public land mobile network and the home public land mobile network. And basically what happens then is that, at least in, in this basic configuration, is that all data is routed from the visited network to the home network, and then there it exits the um, mobile network into the internet, which is quite inefficient if you think about it. Then you also have, of course, a legacy uh, radio access. In this case, we have the GRAN, so GSM, GPRS, and we have the UTRAN, so UMTS radio access. And here we have the SGSN, the serv serv Serving GPRS Support Node. And uh, they also need to know some information on re regarding mobility because, if you, as you remember, we want to support handovers between different kinds of radio access technologies. So all this together is a CGP access, yes? And, but we had the, let's say, approach not only to support CGP, but also support other radio access technologies. And therefore, we need to enhance the uh, architecture even more. And in this case, so um, we still have the most important nodes here. I forgot to mention here the HSS, it's the home subs uh, subscriber server. 
it's basically a database where all your uh, data related to, um, let's say, to your subscription. So, for example, your, your telephone number, your email, so, so your unique identification of the SIM card, and so on is stored. Well, what happens then here that we have different kind of access types. For example, you have trusted non CTV access. This would, for example, be WiMAX with a SIM card. There are also some other criteria which have to be uh, fulfilled in order to be a trusted non CGP access. And you see here then it's uh, connected via, the, via this interface to the PDN gateway. So this is the entry point basically for, um, for non CGP access. So I would say it's not so trusted. <laughs> And of course, you also have non-trusted CGP access. And in this case, you have also additional here on, um, let's say, security gateway, EPG, which kind of filters out everything which should not uh, go into the direction of the mobile operator. And you have also a CGP AAA server, which takes care of everything related, related yeah, authentication and um, accounting and stuff like this. That's basically connected to everything. So this is one um, possibility to also connect non-CGP access like Wi-Fi to the CGP core, but there are many more. So um, if you're really interested into this, there is an uh, overview of this into one of the specification. I, it's, it's, um, I uh, also name it at the end of the document of this presentation. And I think you have six or more different kind of configurations how you can achieve this. But the key point is that um, EPC or EPS um, is able to do interworking between different radio access to uh, technologies. Okay. <coughs> so this was one part. Um, another uh, important aspect is quality of service. So um, mobile operators want to, let's say, uh, guarantee some quality of service for different, yeah, for their users, yes. And for this um, purpose, uh, uh, the TGP the defined um, the bearer concept, which basically means it's like an end-to-end -end virtual, yeah, tunnel, if you want so, which certain QoS um, properties, for example, bandwidth and, uh, and uh, maximum packet loss and something like this. And... Um, these bearers here, are, so the most important one is the EPS bearer, which is, exists between the user equipment and the packet gateway. And the uh, uh, quality of service um, profiles, basically, they apply to this EPS bearer. So on this link here between these two entities, there must, for example, not be more uh, higher packet loss than 10 to the minus of power, uh, 10, to, 10 to the power of minus six. And then you have some sub bearers if you want so between different other network entities like for example radio bearer very important between UE and ENOB and on top you have the ERAP and so on what also should be mentioned is that there's a one to one mapping between the uh, bearer between the EPS bearer and the radio bearer so you cannot have something like I have one EPS bearer and many different radio bearers to do some, let's say, traffic differentiation on this. This is explicitly forbidden in the standard. And um, what's happening is actually is that um, traffic is coming in here from the packet gateway, and here it is mapped with by means of traffic flow templates to different kind of bearers. Yes. So why is this important? Because um, the whole quality of service concept is enforced as a granularity of EPS bearers. And there are two different kind of um, yeah, EPS bearers, if you want so. First of all, there's also always a default radio bearer. So as soon as you switch on your, your mobile phone and, and connect to the network, you get a default radio bearer. So I do the same mistake also. So you get a, a default bearer. And all traffic is mapped in the beginning to this bearer. And so all this traffic also has the same quality of service treatment, if you want so, yes? But then there's also the possibility to set up dedicated bearers for certain type of traffic. And good example, for example, is voice traffic. Voice traffic needs other quality of service 
um, parameters than internet traffic, obviously. And in this case, uh, in this way, you have a differentiation of different service classes, which uh, actually works fine in theory, but has some drawbacks. I will come to this later. So um, what is an uh, EPS bearer QS profile? It consists of, uh, let's say, of a um, triple of um, parameters. One is QCI. That's the QS class indicator, which basically points to a further granular, uh, granular definition of QS parameters. Then you have the ARP, allocation retention priority, which gives you an indication of how hmm, important this kind of traffic is. This is important for admission control in the eNode B. So the eNode B basically then decides because of this value, I can, for example, kick out one user but leave the other in. Yes. And then we have the uh, guaranteed bit rate for a certain type of uh, bearers, for, ex for example, like voice. This means that this bearer also has, always has to get this data rate. So how is it done? So the important thing is that um, packet classification is done in the, let's say, in the PDN gateway. And there it can be done by different means. Packet classification means that each packet has to be inspected, whether it belongs to a certain traffic class or not. And you can think of it, it's, it's quite complex, yes? So if you have, let's say, you have huge amounts of different kinds of um, internet applications and or protocols and all use different kind of, um, yeah, let's say, have different packet profiles. So and if you want uh, want to find out uh, which traffic belongs to which, um, let's say, service flow, then you have to do it in, in the packet data network a gateway. And this uh, can be quite, let's say, uh, demanding computationally. So you can do this by means of IP5 tuples or by means of DPI, which is, of course, even more demanding. But um, at least this is the idea behind all this um, QoS concept. And, in four, and, and the e node B then just takes the, the QoS profile and maps it to certain parameters. So but there's another aspect here it's, uh, on the, uh, in the um, packet data network gateway. There's the policy and charging control, the PCC function. The PCC function basically um, enforces QoS policies on bearers, yes? So all this thing here is the policy, it's the PCC. And the most important part here is the PCRF, which we already saw before, and the PCEF. The PCEF is the poli pol um, policy and charging enforcement function. So this function here in the gateway actually uh, tells, uh, marks basically packets as belonging to one certain bearer. And the PCRF uh, gives the PCF the rules how to do this. Yes? Um, the diagnosis of class of packet has to be done at each router, just one at one node in the architecture? At one node, in, at, the, at the PTN gateway. Because then it is it's tunneled in, into a GTP tunnel, and then it has a unique identity, basically. So it then uh, the system knows that it belongs to this, to this bearer. For each class and for each for each service flow, basically. Uh, well, it depends. <laughs> for each marked service flow. So some default quality of service classes. <clears throat> I think you probably have seen it. So there are nine predefined uh, quality of service classes, and they are all, uh, again grouped into, into um, guaranteed bitrate classes and non-guaranteed bitrate classes, with different RP priorities. You see it here. And the, the only parameters which are defined here are a packet delay budget, end-to-end, -end between UE and PCF, just to remember, so not between UE and E node B. And uh, also packet error loss rate, also again, end-to-end, -end, not uh, between UE and E node B. And these different classes are then um, yeah, uh, mapped to different example services. 
uh, but you are free, or operators are free actually to define more QCI classes, yes? So it's only an example for default QCI classes, which are always implemented, but you can do more. So what's important is here that this, this QCI core S parameters, they must be mapped to scheduling par and, or radio resource management parameters in, in the e node B. For example, if you have a nice scheduler, you have to take this packet error rate and packet delay budgets, have to transform it to take into account of the uh, rest of the network, basically, and then yeah, adapt the parameters for it, also of hybrid IQ and RQ. So, so in theory, this is um, how quality of service and policy control works. So again, maybe to, to show it a little bit more, um, let's say, yeah, in a nicer way. So the ideal case is that you have the internet with its various applications, like for example, they always use Skype as an example, or video, or you have some nice cloud solutions and stuff like this, whatever you can think of. Then this traffic comes to the PCC, um, co-located with the packet gateway, and the PCC maps this internet traffic to EPS bearers, so in the best case, to dedicated EPS bearers. For example, then you have an extra dedicated bearer for Skype, you have one extra bearer for video with a certain guaranteed bit rate. In the end, all this traffic is transported on its dedicated bearer to the E-Node B. The E-Node B knows the uh, quality of service parameters and is able to map it perfectly on, on the radio interface that, that, that they have a perfect quality of experience here on the user equipment side. That's how it perfect normally works, or no, ideally works. Uh, in theory, it's, or in, in the reality today, looks different. The rea reality today is that all internet traffic is mapped to the default bearer, and all traffic is used, they are treated the same way, and yeah, you have no guarantee actually uh, for your quality of experience or quality of service in the UE. At least that's my understanding of how it's implemented today. But it's not so good, and uh, I think there's a lot of uh, room for improvements and for further research to, yeah, to make this better. Okay. <coughs> so how in time? Um, so this was basically an overview of an evolved packet system, at least the aspect which, which, which I selected for this. Are there any questions? On, on this part, regarding some functionality which you are not. I'm yeah. wondering about <coughs> the whole tunneling procedure. I mean, yeah. aren't we doing a little overkill of the whole whole system? How much do we really need it? Or is it just an artifact of our <coughs> radio access network uh, priority classes or we have something to map to? No. Because if I think we talked about Wi-Fi maybe even being able now to do all the mobility, etc., it means it will be flat until the access point. Oh, no, okay, but um, so you need for two things. Uh, the first thing is actually mobility. Because you remember the, the, the um, serving gateway is the mobility anchor. And I should have cho shown this. So if you move from one E node B to the next one, the, the, um, the serving gateway will switch the tunnels from one E node B to the next. Yes? And if you have an hand, you can also have a hand over between serving gateways, then it completely switches the whole, let's say, yeah, hand over the whole tunnel to this. That's the first reason why you need it. Well, it turns out that Wi-Fi is working on a way that you get around that. We don't know whether it will work. I don't know. But this is what I understood. If it works, it means the whole bearer thingy for for the handover. Well, it's well, complicating life. I, okay, I'm, I'm not sure about this Wi-Fi uh, hotspot tool, but in, as far as I understood, it's more an enabling technology to 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 enable a fast recognition of or scanning of, of co-locate of neighboring uh, Wi-Fi access points so that you can do a handover on, on layer two, yes? But you still need to do handover on layer three. You, yeah, you still need to, do, need to do the mobility management on, on top of it. And for this, you can use mobile IP or whatever, of course. Yeah, there is also. Actually, um, you, this, the whole EPS is also available in a uh, proxy mobile IP flavor. Yes, but, <laughs> but I, I didn't want to show it because... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and the second, yeah. 
uh, yeah, just uh, to make sure, uh, um, the hotspot 2.0 um, is currently addressing uh, mobility, but more in a roaming scenario, you know, okay. not connected state uh, mobility, right? Uh, the second point is that uh, uh, connected state mobility in Wi-Fi also exists, as Andrea said, it can be layered too, <clears throat> and in fact is typically implemented in enterprise Wi-Fi implementations. Now, in those cases, there is uh, always a Wi-Fi controller within an enterprise which manages this uh, <clears throat> layer two handovers and all that stuff. Um, which is still, uh, you know, to your point, um, much closer to the edge than it is in the 3GPP case, you know. Uh, the last point I want to mention is there is this whole billing issue and the license spectrum, I think, you know. It's probably one reason why, uh, and, 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 and then the wide area mobility. I mean, you know, Wi-Fi mobility, even in an enterprise, is still, within a local geographic region. So I mean, if you do want to implement mobility across the nation, I mean, you know, you do need probably to go back uh, into the network. And 3GPP networks are built for that kind of mobility. Um, and, and then, the, you know, the fact that you're using a license spectrum, I mean, makes, makes a lot of difference. I mean, so they want to charge you, so they need to bring your pipes back all the way. <laughs> In fact, that's one reason why also, you know, I mentioned this LIPA, a local IP access and local offload. Uh, they're nice solutions, but there is still some reservation uh, in, for the operators to fully implement it because of you know those those kind of uh, reasons. You know, not being able to uh, monitor. Uh, I mean, that said, the only other thing I do want to say in, in you know in in, um, in support of the mobile operator's position is legal interception. Sometimes there is a problem in pushing traffic all the way to the edge because you do run into legal interception issues, which means that, you know, the traffic needs to, you know, come back to some legal interception point, which is typically deeper in the network, you know, so. Yeah. Also, um, as you said, so one aspect is, again, this uh, bearer mapping related, uh, or let's say, associated QoS profiles, which you get it for free, basically. It's built in GTP because you have an identifier for this. And it pr also provides security. So it's um, uh, encrypted between the E0B and the um, serving gateway. Mm -hmm. so. Well, f for me, one of the major arguments why I would keep the whole, the whole tunneling thing is that you're able, essentially, to inspect traffic and actually leverage charges on different uh, traffic types. Yes. But nobody's doing it. I find it so strange because, I mean, capacity is uh, increasing exponentially. Yeah. Revenues are going like that. And uh, the operators are not piggybacking the costs they have to support the infrastructure onto Google, Skype, uh, Facebook, and all these who make really money out of the infrastructure. And that is a way of doing it, but nobody is, is doing it. So I, I find it very absurd, the whole situation. You know, so uh, an operator is, is paying for the party and uh, somebody else is enjoying it, essentially. Absolutely agree. Mm. Yeah, they should. They, they have a problem of uh, losing the customers. Mm -hmm. Actually, there has been an unprecedented uh, um, uh, thing here in Spain. Uh, actually, exactly a year ago, Telefonica and Google undersigned a contract mm -hmm. where Google would pay part of the infrastructure, understanding that the users would be happier yeah. uh, with a better infrastructure. Yeah. I'm not sure it w well it's a, it's core network so it I mean, sorry it's it's internet you know so it's not the the mobile access but thi I mean this is like the most expensive part of the whole infrastructure so um you know they they should essentially pay for the for the bits they're pumping through Yeah I'm not saying it should go to the user it shouldn't go to the user in fact, we should use it for free. Yeah, yeah actually, the, the, that is a very uh, important point. I mean, the, they call them the over-the-top uh, services, right? The Google and YouTube and all that, right? Uh, so the operator has no knowledge of it. 
Um, but what is happening, uh, we will have to see the success of it, but in GSMA, uh, there is uh, some effort in trying to, um, you know, for the mobile operator to work with the over-the-top application providers so that, you know, uh, they can, for example, provide a certain quality of service. <coughs> so what is needed is that some APIs need to be, or some agreements, of co business level agreements, of course, should be there. But beyond that, too, there must be some way to detect those yes. uh, flows and, and then provide that. Um, because to me, that can be a win-win situation. Because yeah. if those hooks are in place and the business agreements are in place, then, you know, Netflix will prefer to pump their video on a network where there is a, you know, call agreement as opposed to a best effort core network, you know. So it, it, uh, I believe it is uh, being talked about in GSMA. I don't know exactly what is the status of it. Just the one other point about the mobility part, you know, um, I do want to mention there is an IETF, uh, a uh, work called Distributed Mobility Management, DMM, uh, where the idea is actually to push the mobility management. Right now it's all anchored uh, sort of deep in the network, even in mobile IP, for example, right? Mm. You've got to go all the way to the home agent. So the DMM uh, work basically tries to distribute that uh, anchoring functionality. Um, in fact, we're working with one of uh, professors from, from Spain on that project. <laughs> he, he's actually, a, uh, I'll get his name, but uh, no, Carlos Bar, Bar, Bernardo, Bernardo, yeah, 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 yeah. Which university is in? I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's done a lot of work in this area, and we're actually you working. Need to over the, over the types, no, 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 no. Not necessary. I mean, on demand, you. I mean, you know, right? Uh, say, you know, you're 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 watching Netflix. So at that point, it's detected, and uh, it may translate to some billing, you know, you may pay, pay more. Or, or it may be actually absorbed, like you said, between Netflix, the over-the-top providers and the network, pro uh, the operator, uh, network uh, operator. I mean, it can very well be like that. So, um, okay, so back to the topic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but no, no, no problem. <laughs> Very interesting discussion, actually. Oh, my, my computer already <laughs> thinks it's, it's <laughs> time to sleep here. Okay, uh, uh, I, I, okay. This, um, so this was basically um, EPC uh, and EPS. So we remember that um, EPS comprises so evolved packet system comprises the evolved packet core, which was a, a large part of that now, and it also comprises the uh, um, evolved UTRAN. And um, so I would like also to give a short, brief overview of, of the um, evolved UTRAN. But I want to keep it a little bit shorter because um, I think uh, that you guys actually are more coming from this direction. So but what are the basic principles? So one, is, uh, one basic fundamental principle is actually to have a flat architecture uh, if you compare to the, to the UMTS architecture and also to the GPRS actually. actually. So you have no radio network controller, which was in the old UMTS architecture, basically it's um, the point where, um, let's say, all Mac-related, uh, so the higher Mac uh, stuff did happen, including also um, scheduling. And uh, you basically, uh, all radio-related functions are now located in the e -node B, also including admission control and, and so on. So you have a kind of distributed, um, yeah, radio and uh, function uh, emission control if you want so so another um, uh, principle is to minimize the signaling towards the EPC especially for handovers and that's also one of the reasons why you have an interface between different e node B's yes so in the ideal case if you do a handover you don't need to involve the MME the mobility management entity at all you just do you just do your uh, handovers. You just con contact your um, target E node B, and um, yeah, do some information exchange between uh, both entities, and that's it basically. So no additional signaling towards EPC. And the X2 interface, also, of course, can also be used for handover neighbor detection interference coordination. I think you're pretty well aware of that. Then self-organizing networks or SON functions. 
very important to mitigate the management overhead because operators don't want to, it's expected that you need more base stations than in the current network simply because you have to serve more use, uh, let's have to serve higher data rates which automatically means smaller cells. Um, you know this and the operators don't want to, 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 to pay for all this management efforts there. So you have some uh, SON functions to, to reduce these uh, efforts uh, mainly for stuff like neighbor relations or so which E or B is co-located to which other E or B, random access channel optimization, PCI selection, so the uh, physical cell identifier, which we know should be orthogonal in the neighborhood, and other mobility parameter optimizations. And we have support for handovers to other radio access technologies uh, like GPS, UMTS, obviously. And for voice, voice is a difficult issue. There are certain uh, different solutions like CS fallback, so circuit switch fallback, where um, the U is basically pulled out of LTE into, for example, UMTS network to support voice. Another one was single radio voice call continuity. So this is basically if you have an IMS uh, voice, um, if, you have, if you have an IMS voice connection already set up, but you don't have any coverage for LTE anymore. Um, and of course, you have also support for FAMTO cells, which are called home E node B. Yeah. Just, just a quick question. About this X2 interface, does 3GPP? Does 3GPP specify the scope, spatial scope of this interface? Means one base station E node B should be connected to at least, say, three. Uh, so, no. No? Means it, how, how to decide, for example, for many song functionalities, this X2 interface is required, but uh, physically there, there is a need to be connected to some base stations. It can be in mesh topology, it can be in star topology, it can be in, uh, means, uh, is there any detail on that? So I think the only detail is that uh, an, an X2 interface may exist, it must not exist, between two E node Bs, yes. But how do you set up the X2 interface and that's basically up, up to, to operator. your own, yeah, up to the operator. Operator. Well, the vendor also. Vendor. Yeah. Because the SON solutions will ultimately depend on the topology connectivity. Of course. For example, yeah, if there is no connectivity between, uh, say, all the six neighboring base stations. Yeah, then. Then you cannot kind of design the same SON solution yes, as yeah. you could in that scenario. Yeah. So there's no specification on that. It's no. So basically, the, the always CGP let's say, provides a framework to build solutions, but not, it does not specify only the, the how things are done are normally not specified. The only exception is when, if it's really required. So in fact, it is required that you do power control in a certain way. Mm -hmm. yes, otherwise, mm -hmm. the whole system breaks down. Yeah. But scheduling, for example, you can do whatever you want. This is not specified. But for the it researchers on SON, this becomes a kind of question where you have to stop and think, okay, what would be the topology, and then you have to tailor your yeah, solution. The uh, topology depends also strongly on the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on the deployment. Uh, so just an overview of what is the um, evolved U-Tron. So we have... Um, Basically, it's <laughs> quite easy. Uh, only the E node Bs are part of the um, of the run of the radio access networks, and we have uh, interfaces, as we learned, uh, between the different E node Bs, the X2 interface, and also we have interfaces toward the core. In this case, uh, toward the MME for user plane data for mobility management, and towards the serving gate for, for user plane data. So, no, sorry for control plane data for towards the MME. So that's S1C, uh, S1 MME, sorry. And uh, user plane data towards the serving gateway that's called S1U. Very intuitive. Then there are different flavors. We have um, normal E node B, macro E node Bs, if you want so. We have home E node Bs, and since release 10, we have also between home E node B uh, an X2 interface. So this was not the case uh, until this release. And we also have now EU turn with relay nodes, basically, where we have here a donor E node B and a relay node. The relay node base is, is, is more or less just a normal E node B, which um, yeah, uses the connection to the donor E node B as an, um, as an in-band backhaul, if you want so. And of course, 
um, so the EPC uh, entities here are also included because these are important for some of the um, management functions which are important, uh, which are uh, required in the in the uh, radio access network. As we can see here, for example, yes, it shows the functional split, split between the EU TRA and the EPC. So, um, so what you can say as a rule of thumb is that everything directly related to radio aspects is located in the in the B. Yes. So that's of course everything here, um, which is rel relates to the uh, UU interface between the, the UE and the E node B, basically the protocol stack. Yeah. Of course, that must be at least to some part uh, located in the E node B, and here everything is located in the, in the E node B. And all these functions, which are um, were, were formerly uh, allocated in other uh, deeper network uh, entities like RNC, like radio admission control, um, radio barrier control, uh, intercell radio resource management, and of course the scheduling is also located in the node B. But more interesting, what is not located in the e node B, so everything regarding idle state mobility handling is done by the um, by the MME, EPS barrier control, as we learned, is done by the uh, MME and the PDN gateway also. And here for mobility, we have the serving gateway, mobility anchoring, UUE IP packet address allocation and packet filtering on the packet gateway. So, so may, of course you know a lot about phi, a just very brief overview, what is the important aspects here, OFDMA is used, single carry FDMA and uplink is used to reduce the peak over average power ratio. And as I said before, it's, we have scalable spectrum use, which is very important. If you want to use some spectra which came free, maybe from uh, TV, analog TV or something like this, so you can scale it here from 1.4 megahertz to 20 megahertz actually, and then you can, again, uh, in later releases of LTE, you can use carry aggregation to use different bands uh, at the same time, which are located at different frequency. There's a possibility to do localized or distributed resource allocation for either frequency selective or frequency diverse scheduling, depending always on the, on the channel uh, conditions. Uh, lots of support for spatial multiplexing to get more uh, bits per second per hertz. And um, we have frequency and time division duplex um, flavors, basically, for paired and for unpaired spectrum. So T LTE TDD is um, primarily developed for the Chinese market. Just a brief overview of the frame structure here for FTD. So we have a frame which is 10 milliseconds long. The frame consists of subframes, each is one millisecond long. Each subframe is again part in two slots of 0 0.5 milliseconds. And then you have um, six or seven of the AMs, of the AM symbols per slot, depending on the um, yeah, slot number, basically. And uh, we have the resource grid here, where one resource element basically consists of one carrier times one of the M symbol, and one resource block. It is basically the allocation, the minimum allocation granularity for um, data it consists of 12 sub carriers um, times um, one slot. And here there are also reference symbols included, which are in this case for two different antennas. Maybe what's also interesting is that um, control data is, well, let's say important control data is um, normally located in the center of the frequency um, spec, yeah, of the, of the carrier, if you want so, in order to uh, simplify the acquisition of the, of, of, of the cell, of the broadcast ch um, channel. And in this broadcast channel, there's a master information block, MIP, in each first uh, subframe um, uh, of a frame. And in this uh, MIP, there's information about, for example, the location of the random access channel in order to get an access to the, to the um, or to perform network attachment um, information about uh, the cell ID, the global cell ID, and so on. And um, so this, mo uh, this uh, mass information block is distributed uh, on four frames. So you need it, the minimum time you need to acquire a signal from LTE is 40 milliseconds because of this. 
then you can basically, you know, aha, there's an E node B with this and this information, and then can, can try to attach to this E node B. So just um, a short overview of the data or of the <laughs> yeah, data path, which um, can, which is uh, defined between the, the higher layers and the lower layers. So we have different kind of uh, channel definitions, which have the, the logical channels, transport channels, and physical channels. And I just um, show here the user plane data, the path of the user plane data uh, through this um, yeah, tree of, I can even say jungle, <laughs> of different um, channel definitions. So on, to on, on the uh, top here we have the downlink transport channel, which is mapped on the downlink shared uh, channel. Yes, it's a um, logical channel, interestingly. And then it's mapped to the uh, physical downlink shared channel, which is basically more or less yeah, um, the, 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 the frame structure itself. And on the uplink, it's directly the other way around. We have the physical uplink shared channel, uplink shared channel, and then again the data transport channel. And we have a lot of different uh, control channel types, paging, control channel, broadcast control channel. So this is, again, for the uh, master information block and system information block, common control channel, and so on. And um, so how a little bit more detailed view of, of the protocol stack of LTE. Um, I don't want to go to, in too much detail into the lower uh, areas, because you probably know this very well. But on the, on the higher layers, maybe not. So on the top, we have the uh, packet data conversion protocol. And this is responsible for one for robust header compression. <laughs> robust header compression basically um, yeah, is a very important feature for uh, voice over LTE. Because uh, voice traffic has um, very s small packet sizes, which um, all require an IP header. And uh, this overhead is so large that it's, it's, it's really um, reducing the capacity if you don't compress this overhead to a significant amount. So this is done by robust header compression, uh, which ensures that um, the, the voice capacity of LTE is indeed as large as it was, um, as, let's say, advertised uh, towards uh, uh, ITUR. Then we have security functions here for ciphering integrity protection on the control, planets, control plane. Then we have the uh, radio link control protocol with segmentation of the uh, packets, which coming from upper layers in different modes. Acknowledge mode means that we have a sliding window, obviously um, RQ. Uh, unacknowledged mode is just um, yeah, without any um, um, reliability or um, retransmissions of failed segments. And we also have the transparent mode. And most important here, of course, then uh, b below RLC, actually, the, the scheduling takes place. After all, after all this is done, then the data is mapped into the resource frame. So this is something which should not be actually neglected if you think of performance of um, of uh, cellular systems, yes. So many people just say we do, we, we calculate bit per second per hertz, but this upper layer stuff, it um, can have significant impact on the performance of a system. Okay, so just want to see, oh, it's a little bit late. I try to, to speed up a little bit. So femtocells. So that's basically the reasons why we, why you're all here. And um, femtocells in in um, in CGBP are not existing. So there are no femtocells, if you want so. The term femtocell, I think, does not uh, appear in any official document of the <laughs> of the CGP, or at least in a specification. So instead, CGP defines the home E node B in that the home e node B is a customer premise equipment that connects a CGP UE, so a mobile phone, over the EU channel wireless air interface, over an LTE air interface, to a mobile operator's network using a broadband IP backhaul, something like DSL or, or fiber or whatever. Basic means it's a low power, low cost e node B with access control. 
and uh, some kind of secured, um, yeah, hopefully secured uh, transport to the mobile core. In most cases, it's IPsec, I think. And it also uses the same the license spectrum as macro enode B, so the other enode Bs as in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the network. So, which means it's um, basically a normal base station. It's just connected via DSL, for example. But <coughs> the operators or the GPP on behalf of the operators has some large set of requirements on the home enode B capabilities. And uh, it's an interesting read if you want to look it up. So first is the operators are more or less in full control of the radio interface of the, of the home enode B, which is logically because uh, they are operating in license spectrum, yes? So the operator really needs to, they can switch it on, they can switch it off if they want. They can, they, they are in control of the scheduling, basically, of the power, basically of everything. Also, the operator must be able to locate the home enode bees to check conformance with regulations. Because you can think of situations where you just take your, your nice femto cell and go somewhere in another country, for example, from, from Spain to, I don't know, Russia or whatever. And um, there are completely different type of spectrum available for, um, for LTE in this case. You're simply not allowed to, to switch your, um, your femto cell on there. So this must be, let's say, ensured that this does not happen. Then configuration is, of course, very important, but the configuration efforts should be minimized. So they want to uh, configure, of course, the he not b but it is as less as possible. Then uh, different modes of access control, open mode, closed mode, or hybrid access mode. Then uh, the UEs should display the uh, G C CSG type and the home enode B name. So if you have your, your UE, then there should be something like, for example, um, yeah, Misha's home enode B, and he then knows, okay, now I can connect to this home enode B. Where is he, by the way? Okay. Ah, here. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, so um, then users should be able to scan for available home enode Bs and manually select to connect to this home enode B. And the integrity of the home enode B must be validated before communication, which means basically uh, there must be means, uh, the, some efforts must be taken so that nobody can tinker around and hack the uh, enode B and, and tries to get into the operator's network, which is not very nice. So this is basically, um, in my opinion, what defines a femtocell in a CGP network. The requirements on, yeah, on operation and on management. So the architecture looks like this. So three minutes? OK. Um, so basically, what's, what's implemented here is we have the normal ha uh, home enode B, which is connected to the EPC with a very normal um, interfaces, S1MME, S1U. And in between, we may have a home enode B gateway, which serves as a concentrator for the control signaling here. Yes, so make it a little bit more scalable and um, easier to handle, basically. We have a security gateway, and we have the home enobi management system. And we have the X2 interface, but as we know, only since release 10. Then we have different kinds of access control. So the closed subscriber group uh, basically means that only MEM or UEs, which are part of a certain list, which of this group basically are allowed to access a UE. And this basically um, yeah, uh, can be enforced with different lists. One is the allowed CSG list, ACL, which is maintained by the user, for example, via web interface. And the other one is the operator CSG list, OCL, which is pre-provisions list of the, um, of the operator. And the CSG ID, so each of the CSG group has an ID, is uh, broadcast by the home enode B. So this is a way how the UE actually go is aware of whether it belongs to this uh, CSG or not. Just an, this would be an example of mobility and would also explain how PCI confusion is solved. We heard this before. I think I will just talk about it. Um, because it's uh, uh, quite interesting. It's a new feature in release 10. So this is a mobility example from the enode B to the home enode B, yes? And um, what happens first is the source enode B tells the UE you, have, you could uh, report proximity towards an enode B, a home enode B, which is known. 
So this is pro proximity indication. The UE reports this proximity indication so the source E node B. If the source E node B, uh, if the target E node B is in CSG whitelist, then the source E node B tells do a reconfiguration, um, do a measurement basically of the um, physical cell identifier. Yeah. Uh, the problem is the PCI, there are not so many PCI, there are 400, 504 PCIs in total in the, in the system defined. So it could very well happen that there are many um, home E node Bs with the same PCI in the same coverage area of the of a target uh, E node B. So there's a confusion because the target E node B does not know to which home E node B should it connect them. So uh, is it solved in a very pragmatic way because the UE um, gets the, the command to uh, scan for the system information, for the master information block from the target E node B. This takes some time, as we know, at least 40 milliseconds, and also it's a little bit uh, power consuming. But after this, it gets the global, uh, globe, uh, cell global identifier, which uniquely identifies the cell, and it gets some additional information, the um, checking area ID and the uh, CSG ID and so on. And then the UE can report this information back to the source E node B. The source E node B in this case knows, aha, I have to connect to this home E node B, but not to the other home E node B. That's basically how uh, the PCI confusion is solved in release 10. It probably has some more room for optimization. Okay, how many minutes do we have? I have maybe um, two more slides. Okay, let's say um, <coughs> interference coordination, of course, is also a very important point, and there are currently two approaches uh, discussed in CGPP, and one is interference avoidance based on carry aggregation, which basically means that in case that you have at least two carriers here indicated by F1, F2, for both macro and FEM2 cells. You have to, you can schedule your control information on orthogonal carriers, so one here, one here, so not sub-carriers, carriers, yes, in order to avoid any kind of control channel interference between um, yeah, these two layers of the network, because that's the main problem, control channel interference, because you cannot schedule control channel information out of the way, yes between uh, different network layers. And what you can then do is you can do either yeah, just use these different layers or you can also do cross-carrier hmm, cross scheduling if you want. So, so you can say here, I want to schedule my data now into uh, this uh, carrier which is normally used by the macro cell or the other way around. But this is an approach that is more likely used for or for small cells. For fem cells, it's probably a little bit uh, unclear whether this will be used. And for this, um, we have another approach, which is time division multiplexing, basically, with almost blank subframes. It's a very <laughs> nice term. I like it. Because um, what it basically means is that subframes are muted out. So there is no information sent on certain subframes, in, I think in, in all cases, in the femto side, so that the UE can still hear the macro cell, yes? But it cannot be completely muted out. You still need to send, send some control information. For example, the common reference symbol, synchronization reference symbols, and so on. And that's the reason why it is called um, almost blank subframes. The problem here is, of course, that you lose capacity here because you cannot schedule anything here. Also, you have high degree of variation in interference during this time. So this is normally not very nice for the overall stability of the network. And we will skip all this and come just to the end where we'll show some hot top topics which I think are, will become very important or are already important in the very near future. One is of course the whole topic of heterogeneous networks. So you have seen there's a lot to do there. Mobility enhancement, um, if you think you're moving around an area where many small cells, large cells on top of each other, so you can do uh, handover optimization according to your speed, according to the tra traffic type, and so on. 
so there's a lot of room for uh, improvement there. And also, of course, for intercell interference coordination. I think now, after enhanced interference coordination, so EICIC, we even have now further enhanced uh, interference coordination as a work item in, in I think, for release 12 of LTE. Uh, then we have carrier aggregation, which basically means that we want to use simultaneously several component carriers at the same time. So we have nice flexibility for also not only in terms of bandwidth in total, but also in the ratio, for example, for the uplink and for the downlink carriers. You can think of something like you have two times uh, 20 megahertz carrier in the downlink, and we have one times 10 megahertz carrier in the uplink. The only problem may be something <coughs> related to regulation in this case. Um, but we are, there are some challenges for synchronization, because if the carriers are on different frequencies, you have a different uh, time advance values, basically, yes? So this is something which still has to be solved. And also for MAC controls, like random access channel, where is uh, which um, information scheduled when. Then we have uh, optimizations or enhances for machine type communication. So as you know, machine-to-machine um, -machine traffic becomes very important because uh, M2M means you have a huge number of devices which only sends a small number of data. And the whole system is not optimized for this kind of traffic because you need to set up, which we have seen, you need to set up all the bearers, you need to do all the state management in the core and so on. And this is something um, which is not efficient for this small data uh, volume. So there, there is a lot of um, work and efforts going on in this direction. Then also user plane congestion control because we have seen on real life examples that operators are <laughs> have a lot of problems with um, in, in congested scenarios right now. And this will not go away in the future just because we have maybe a little bit better, or maybe even a lot of better radio access network. We still will have congestion in the network. And this is something which has to be solved rather quick, I would say. And of course, also an uh, always uh, good topic is coordinated multi-point transmissions, which was promised actually to be already part of release number 10, but got postponed and postponed because rather complex topic, but uh, it's still, of course, um, on the work item list of CGPP. And that's it from my side. So I have some information about important links and documents here. And um, yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. I think we had a good uh, good discussion during your talk, Andreas. Really, yes. Are there any 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 other questions burning up in the audience? Uh, um, you? No. One last one. Yeah, last one. <laughs> your, your your question counter is on zero. <laughs> <laughs> the simple question: Why in LT restricted to PCI to be just 400 or something? Yeah, so good question. Um, I think it has to do with the, um, first of all, is there an expert in the audience which can answer this question? Because I see that because of this limitation, they are going through a lot of trouble in addressing, and yes. the addressing process is very complicated, so I understand it's a, even it's, for macro cells. I understand it's a orthogonal sequence, which is basically, uh, so the PCI is, 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 is um, uh, coded with an orthogonal sequence, and the orthogonal sequence has a certain length and this length restricts uh, uh, the values to 504 yeah, but we items. Yeah, have more longer, by just increasing one bit, we could go yeah. to 1,000. Probably, so, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not such a DeFi expert. <laughs> it's a design uh, cho selection, choose, basically. OK, then let us thank Andreas again for the fantastic overview. <laughs> And I hope to see you back tomorrow, 9 o'clock, for our second day, which is a little bit more fire-oriented. Very quickly, logistically, if anybody needs a taxi and there's nobody at the reception, just come to see me. I'll get you a taxi. And um, if you go out in Barcelona, just mind the pickpockets. Hotels are safe, so you can leave your documents there. But the pickpockets, please mind them very carefully here in, in Barcelona. All right, thank you very much.